What's up, Hoop fans? Want to know what's even better than NBA season? Yeah, winning some cash. That's right. The second half of the NBA season is starting to heat up and it's time for you to get in on all the action. You can have a shot at huge cash prizes. Join in on all the excitement of real-time betting by downloading the DraftKings app now. New customers, well, listen to this. You can get what's called a no-sweat bet. A no-sweat bet means even if you take an L, you get a bonus bet back up to $1,000 in the amount of your original bet. Minimum deposit is $5. You can sign up using my promo code, BullyBall. That's right. New customers can get a no-sweat bet of up to $1,000 if your first bet loses. And all existing customers get same-game parlay insurance every day. Get a bonus bet back if one leg of your parlay loses. Minimum number of legs are required. Max bet varies. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers use my promo code, Bully ball, get a no sweat bet. That's promo code bully ball. The crown is yours. You already know I'm locked into the NBA schedule and what games are coming up. But sometimes when there are great concerts in town, I don't realize it until it's almost too late. So when I'm trying to grab last minute tickets, game time always has my back. From sports to concerts, game time is the fastest way to buy tickets for all the events near you. And with last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your actual seat that you can see beforehand, and their best price guaranteed. That's right. GameTime is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. You can even see the view from your seat, really, before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect. And with zone deals, you pick the section and the game time picks the seats for you for big savings. The game time guarantee means you will always get the best price. And if you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Takes the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use the code BULLYBALL for $20 off your first purchase. That's right. Code BULLYBALL, $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. Welcome to Bully Ball, presented by DraftKings. I am Rachel Nichols. That, of course, is DeMarcus Cousins. And Boogie, here's my question for you this morning. Mm -hmm. Do I blend in with this couch so much? That I'm just a floating head because I forgot and the material is exactly the same. Man, you make blue you make blue look really good, Rachel, and that's all that matters. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, my friend. I just, you know, if, if you're watching this at home and I disappear into the sofa, just know why. That's all I'm saying. Um, <laughs> but we got to talk about the Western Conference standings because it's been bunched for a while, but it's getting serious now with so few games left to go. Um, the Suns and Kings, they both leapt into the top six after their wins on Sunday. And, and Phoenix, that was pretty high profile win right with that you know beating the Lakers and that's how the West is right now I mean you win one game you're you're up here you're down here and those top six spots are obviously so important for the play-in the downer for the Suns though is that Bradley Beal is still out hamstring injury right now they thought he was going to be able to come back a couple days ago has not been able to did a pregame warm-up and cut it short uh they have the toughest strength of schedule remaining in the league. If you just go look at their last, you know, go from the bottom of their schedule and, and look at the 10 games that they have to finish with, it, it's insane. I mean, it's an insane schedule. I, I guess I'm just wondering, with Bradley out again, Booker's been out. I mean, how confident are you with the health of this team if they can squeak in to the playoffs? Well, that was that was always going to be the biggest thing for this Suns team is, you know, dealing with health. Uh, you know, Kevin Durant has had his injury pass. Um, Bill ha has had his. And as of recently, he's been dealing with one this entire season. So, um, and you can't ignore the fact that a hamstring injury lingers the way that it does. Um, even with, I, I do like the precaution they're going with, uh, they're going about with, you know, dealing with Bill's hamstring injury. But uh, any person that knows how a hamstring works, it's an injury that can linger for the rest of this season, even going into the playoffs. So uh, that's always a scary thing. So you have to be really, really cautious when moving forward with that. But, I mean, obviously with the talent that's on this roster, um, 
if you said in the beginning of the season that their season would go the way that it has this year, I don't think anybody would have, you know, agreed or even guessed that that would be the case. But uh, they have found a way to stay afloat this season. They are still one of the most talented teams on paper in this league. And um, if they do find a way to, you know, to get healthy before this season finishes out, um, it could be a make or break type situation for them. And the reason I say that, uh, they do have one of the hardest schedules finishing out the year. So it could be a situation where, you know, it goes to complete shit and, you know, they kind of crumble towards the end. Or it could be a situation where it's, it's, it's where they're, they're going to go into the playoffs very, very polished. And, um, you know, being able to finish out the season with these tough 10 games or 10 plus games or so, um, it's a make or break type situation. And, um, you know, obviously health is the huge concern, but on paper they have everything they they need to win a championship or compete for one. Um, it's just going to come down to the small detailed things of if everybody's on the same page, is that if, if everybody is healthy at the same time and well, that- how they decide to finish this season out. Being on the same page, I think, is part of the issue here because, I mean, look, by the way, it's been super frustrating for Brad. No one is more upset at the way things have gone for him this season than he is. I've talked to him. Um, But if they are healthy even on day one of the playoffs, they will have barely all played together. I mean, Boogie, how important is that for a team? I mean, they're all vets. I get it. But you also have a supporting cast there. And how, how big a deal is it that they won't have had a lot of time together on the court? It, it's a really big deal, and it's uh, obviously you can always talk about the chemistry and the camaraderie and the flow of the game when all three guys are on the floor. But when you just look at it from an individual standpoint of just Bradley Bill alone, um, I've been in that type of situation. I've had a season where I where I was in and out all year, and I never really found my rhythm or 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 was in a consistent flow when it came to just performing on a nightly basis. Um, and it's and it's a kind of identical situation because I ended up returning during the playoffs, which is which is a challenge within itself. The playoffs are already hard because the level of competition raises. Uh, the defensive schemes they change. The the uh, the way they prioritize prioritize certain players and defensive schemes and things of that nature. It's going to make the game that much more difficult. So if if you come in and you're already out of rhythm and you have to face that type of dynamic, that, that's a tough thing that, you know, to deal with. So, um, like I said, I think it's more of a challenge for Bradley Bill in the individual standpoint compared to, you know, having those three guys all out there together and making it flow. Um, they're still a dangerous team with just Kevin Durant and Devin Booker, but they're a much more dangerous team when they're all healthy, all in rhythm and all flowing with their three headed monster. Yeah, I mean, I I still am very curious to see what happens with them. The talent there is just kind of intoxicating in terms of like, well, that could be fun. But they have a lot stacked up against them. The injuries, the the lack of, of being able to establish chemistry, the strength of schedule. They've had the easiest schedule up until now. So the idea that they've had the easiest schedule and they're only where they are in the standings because of all these injuries and other factors. And now they've got just a monster coming up. So it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I do know someone who's a fighter, though, Boogie. That is Kevin Durant. He understands not just the game, but the game within the game within the game. Uh, And Charles Barkley had some comments about him during All-Star Weekend. And uh, I think Kevin heard it. This is my opinion. My opinion is that Kevin knows what he said. And this is why. Uh, Barkley's comments was that KD is a follower, not a leader. It was pretty harsh talking about him. Now, on yesterday's broadcast, I want you to take a listen here. KD used the word leadership or some variation of it six times. Listen. This was a complete team performance. What impressed you most? Our leadership. I think our leadership won this game. Uh, struggles was first of the game, but everybody was talking. Our coaches leading us, players were leading us, and that just helped the ball go into the rim and helped us on defense. A knock on this team has been fourth quarter play. What did you see from your group in that final period? Like I said, just our leadership, man. We came through and everybody was talking on the same page. We made big shot after big shot, and we got stopped. So credit the leadership of the coaches and the players. How do you feel? about Katie's response there to Charles? Um, I can't be mad at it. And um, the reason I say that is because 
it's already been said and well known that KD leads the way that he leads. Um, he leads by example. He's not really the guy that does a lot of barking. He's not a guy that, you know, wants to be in front of the camera saying all the right things. And that's just not who Kevin Durant is. Um, I think there's different forms of leaders. Uh, you know, you have guys, you have guys like Kevin Durant. Then you have guys like LeBron James, who's very vocal and speaks on every on everything that's going on and, you know, uh, has his hands on everything that's moving. And you have guys like Damian Lillard who, you know, is cool as a fan, gets along with every mm-hmm. teammate, encourages it. So it's always different forms of leadership. And to sit here yeah. and try to, you know, make it seem like it's, it's one right way to go about it, that's that's just not the case. Um, you have to cater to every situation differently. You have to lead, to every, lead in every situation differently. And um, I think Kevin Durant has been his – I think Kevin Durant has been the best leader that he can be in his way of being that. And uh, I like that. To say, and to say he's a follower is just that's that's bullshit and, and corny, honestly. And the reason I say that, who the hell is he following? He's one of the hardest workers we've ever seen in this game. We, he's one of the most skilled players we've we've ever seen in this game. He's one of the most consistent players we've ever seen in this game. So I'm trying to figure out what guys he following to you know, fit this mold. It's, it's I not, guess maybe maybe it's an allusion to him following Kyrie to Brooklyn. I, I don't know. It was a while ago, so I don't know where this coming from at the All-Star game. I mean, that's that still has know. nothing to do with who Kevin Durant is, is, is as a leader. Um, he's in a position well, where he can pick. Him. I did. And he's in a position to where he can pick what teammate he wants to play with. Like, yeah. that's, that's the right he's earned in this league. So, uh, I'm just not really sure how he's being labeled a follower or anything of that nature now. Um, like I said, Kevin Durant is going to lead the way he knows how to lead. Um, he's found success leading the way he has. He's dominated in his league since he stepped foot. So I'm just not really sure who the hell he's following. And if he is following somebody, I wish I would have followed that same fucking person. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, obviously Charles and Katie have their history. Um, They'll never really be on the same page. They view things totally differently. Um, And rightfully so. They're both great. They're both Hall of Famers. Like, they've both had tremendous success in this league. So who who's – how can you sit here and pick and choose who did it the right way? One has championships, one doesn't. But, you know, one is probably respected a little more than the other. So it's – there's really no right answer to this. Um, and I think, honestly, I think they could have both benefited from one another in, in, a, in a way. So um, I don't agree with Charles' comments. Like I said, Katie will lead the way he leads, and um, he's mm-hmm. been doing that, and he's found success doing it. So uh, that's all I really got to say about that. No, I mean, and you were with him. See, you guys were together in a locker room on the court in Golden State. And Mm -hmm. Charles has never been in a locker room with KD. And that's the thing. And I love Chuck, obviously. I worked with him for a long time. And he's great and great for the game. But this is the kind of thing I don't quite understand how you can speak on when you haven't been in that locker room, when you haven't been on a roster with a guy, when you haven't been on the bench and heard what he's telling the other guys. And, you know, KD is a different cat than some of the, like, out there in your face leaders. But he's still been a leader in so many ways. So guys like you who have played with him, to me, you're the ones qualified to speak on what kind of leader he is. And I just got to give Kevin credit because the answers in that post game interview were fantastic. And I I just have to say something about that too. We we're talking about Mm -hmm. who's a follower, who's a leader. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, it's so many young kids coming up in this game and the person that they're modeling their game after or the person that they're following or following his lead is Kevin Durant. Like we see so many young guys coming in. I want to be like Kevin Durant. I'm out. My goal is Kevin Durant, things of this nature. And I mean, as long as I've been playing the game, that's just not the case with Charles Barkley. You don't hear kids coming in and saying, I want to be like Charles Barkley. So like I said, who, who can really say what's a leader or what's the right way to lead or the proper way to lead It's like I said, to each his own, and, you know, you lead the best way you can. No one's trying to follow Charles Barkley on the golf course. I know that. <laughs> uh, let's talk about Dallas real quick. 
Uh, they did lose on Sunday to the Pacers, but they're seven and three in their last 10. Luca is leading the league in usage right now at about 36%. If you want a frame of reference, the highest usage rate ever was Russell Westbrook. I believe the season he won uh, MVP uh, was 41%. So Luca, you know, not quite up there, but still a lot. Uh, he's averaging 34 points a game. He's also averaging nearly 10 assists a game. So if you have a usage rate that high, but you're also averaging nearly 10 assists per game. It's crazy. 8.8 rebounds a game. So I guess the question is, can the Mavs be successful long term if Luka right now, and it's not even the playoffs yet, is playing so many minutes and is so involved in every aspect of the game? Um, I believe so. And um, the reason I say that is, well, one, this is how this Mavs team is built. They're built off the success of Luka. Um, And, you know, we talk about the usage rate and who has the ball in their hands the most. And, you know, you can sit here and try to talk about the negatives of having the ball that much. But at the end of the day, when it comes to this Mavs team, outside of Kyrie Irving, who the hell else is going to – who the hell else is going to have the ball in their hands? Especially a key moment. I want to hear a suggestion on who should have the ball more than Luka Doncic. (laughs) Like, just – I would love to hear the suggestion. And – you know, it's it's silly to even talk about these type of things because Luka is your best player. Like, your second best player is Kyrie, who has the second highest usage rate. It it only makes sense. So, um, like I said, this team is built around Luka. Um, they go as far as he takes them. Um, I think he has a great counter uh, a counterpart in, you know, Kyrie Irving. So, uh, they're figuring things out. Things is working in their favor. Uh you know, they found success lately right after the trade deadline. P.J. P. Washington was a great addition. Uh, Gafford was another great addition. So uh, I think this Miss Maverick team is moving in the right direction. And um, like I said, I think they go as far as Luka takes them, which is what, you know, this whole team has been built around. Yeah, the new additions have just really seamlessly melted in, which I think is a credit to Jason Kidd, not just the way he's X and O coaching, but just, you know, his style is so easygoing with the guys and he's so canny about what to tell them when and things like that. So I credit him for that. Um, Luca's usage, man, I remember when Kyrie came back from his latest injury and Luca's response when they asked him about it was just like, well, I'm so tired. I'm just so glad that he's back because I can be less tired. And he was just so spent at the end of every game. Now he's built for it. Like his build, he's not a frail guy. Like his build is sturdy and, and, and he's used to playing a lot from the time he was a teenager. Um, so I think he's mentally there and ready for it, but, but it's a lot to ask of him. And then also when a guy is that dominant within his own team, it, it can be a factor because obviously you know how defenses change in the playoffs. In fact, the last NBA champion, the last guy to win a title with being a 30 point per game scorer was Michael Jordan. Mm. That was 96. It has been since 1996 that a team won the NBA championship having one guy on the team scoring 30 or more. I, I don't know. That's where, that's where the Mavs are with Luka. I think it's possible. He's in that category of greatness. So um, as far as talent on paper, uh, obviously, Mm -hmm. you know, the achievements and accolades haven't, you know, matched up to Jordan's. But as far as talent and just Mm -hmm. uh, effect on the game, I think he's in that category for sure. Well, they're going to they're gonna try hard to make a run. They've mortgaged a lot of their future. They want Luca to stay. Um, they need this to work out this year. Uh, the West standings, though, are so nuts because when they lost that one game, and again, I want to point out that going into the game, I, I think they were 10-2 and two on a run of 12 games. They fell from fifth place to eighth place on the back of one loss. And, and that's because the Suns, Kings, Pelicans, they're all bunched together there. Um, now the Pelicans also lost. They just lost to the Bulls, but they are seven and three uh, in February. They have the 10th toughest schedule remaining, but their defense is buckled down, which so, so that's good. And then if you look at the, uh, the uh, Kings, uh, Sabonis just had his 20th triple-double on Saturday night. Uh, Fox is averaging almost 33 points a game over the last four games. They'd like to stay out of the play-in, too. So I, I want to just ask you about your old team there, given all the other teams in the West we've talked about. What is your take on the Kings right now and, and what their chances are going forward? Um, 
I mean, I, well, obviously I'm a bit biased. Uh, I always want success for this, you know, this Kings team. I think they did something great last year and, you know, finally ending that drought, making the playoff run. Uh, so they've built a lot of momentum moving forward. They have a young core whose future is very, very bright. Um, the playing style, you know, uh, Coach Brown being in the mix. So it's a lot of things in their favor right now. And I think just moving forward, only thing they need to focus on is, you know, just improving this team, continue to add talent, continue to add complimentary pieces to, you know, De'Aaron Fox and Sabonis. Um, also Monk, who's a huge piece of that team. So uh, they got a lot of things in their favor moving forward. It's just about continuing to, to add the right pieces and improve this team. Mm -hmm. um, I am a little disappointed that after all the success last year, they didn't really make any moves. Uh, no deadline moves, no off-season moves. They just kind of return with the same team. Um, and I think after last year's, you know, uh, success, it should have just been a year of, you know, continuing to build off of that momentum. Um, right. Obviously, they're still in the place of success. They, they are a playoff team. They have a great chance of, you know, missing this play-in. And even if they are in the play-in, that's a very scary team to play for a one-game, you know, all-type situation. So, uh my biggest thing is they just have to continue to improve this team because I think they have the foundation to, you know, find some real, real success in this league. But it's just about adding the right pieces to that talent. So uh, very young, exciting team. And, you know, the, the future is very, very bright for this Kings team. I feel like they're so matchup dependent in this playoff that's coming up. Like, I just feel like whoever they draw in the first round, they could win that round and, and you know, advance or they could get knocked out in the play-in. It just kind of depends a little bit on who they're playing. So that will be interesting. The seeding and the, the switching around in this conference, it seems like it's going to come down to the final day. That's exciting. It's part of what the play-in was built for uh, to make this last kick of the season a little more involved and more fun. But I'm not sure how fun it is for the teams involved. Right, right, right. It seems like these coaches must have a migraine every morning when they wake up and look at the standings because it is nuts out there. Um, and it's made even more nuts when, I don't know, your players are involved in a major brawl. Uh, we had five players suspended in Heat Pelicans uh, the other night. And uh, it got, it got you know, I mean, look, no fight in the NBA is serious. Um, but right. it, it got... It got heated. It got heated. Uh, you had Jimmy Butler and Najee Marshall getting into it. Uh, Marshall ended up choking Butler. Uh, Thomas Bryant got into it with Jose Alvarado, uh, left the bench. They each got three games. So I, I don't know. I just wanted to ask you, because you've been in some scraps, Boogie. Mm -hmm. um, what is the mindset, if you're a player, especially on the bench, and you know the rule, and the rule's been there forever, but you see a fight break out on the court and you want to stick up for your team, what, what do you do in the moment there? What's going through your head? Um, it's a lot of emotions going. Um, it's a lot of thoughts. And um, when things just kind of happen spur at a moment, you know, being an athlete, being a professional athlete, a lot of things are just reactions. It's, it's instinct. So, uh, you know, being role players, being, you know, having certain roles on teams. Some guys are there to be, you know, protectors, protect the stars, things of that nature. So uh, every situation is different. But for the most part, um, if you're a role player, you know, for, you, you want to protect your stars. You want to, one, protect them from harm. Two, you want to protect them from doing anything that's, going to then harm or put the game in harm's way. Uh, you also have to keep in mind that the goal is to win the game at the end of the night. So sometimes it's just pulling that star away or pulling that teammate away to prevent it from moving, you know, going any further or having it to where they can't finish out this game. So like I said, every situation is different. I've never agreed with the rule that if you step on the court, you get suspended. That's like, to me, that's like the front office doing half-ass work, a lazy job of actually, you know, looking into the details of what the situation right, right. is. So it's just like, ah, he was on the court, everybody suspended. So it's, it's just yeah. like, it's to me, it's a, it's a lazy rule. But at the same time, rules are the rules. So uh, as a player, you have to be conscious of that. And even in the most heated moments, you have to, you know, still shift your mind to, you know, protecting your teammates, protecting the team, and still, you know, reaching that end goal, which is winning the game that night. So uh, it's a tough balance, especially in the heat of the moment, but it's it's more than possible. What, what was your biggest sort of hold me back moment? Like which teammate held you back in a scenario on the court where if it hadn't gone that way, it would have been bad for you? Mm, me? Uh, 
none really stick out. I was a pretty mild mannered right. guy. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure that sentence has ever been said about you. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, it, it's it's been a few, and like I said, when your emotions are going, it's the heat of the moment. Um, you know, you always do need those teammates to kind of bring you back to reality or bring you back to a place of calmness and just you know kind of help you refocus. So uh, it, it has been situations for me, and uh, like I said. That's a part of being a teammate, protecting your stars, pr- protecting guys from harming themselves and also the team. And, um, you know, the main goal every night is to go win the game. So uh, I appreciate every you know teammate that kind of righted that situation for me or put me back in a place of focus. I mean, not that you needed it because you were so mild mannered on the court. You know what I mean? You um, know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting you a sign, a desk sign, Mr. Mild Manor. Um, all right. Uh, uh, unfortunate situation in Atlanta, Buggy. The news came out over the weekend. Uh, Trey Young, he will be reevaluated in a month. It's not that he's going to be out a month. He will be out a month and then reevaluated with the finger injury. The Hawks right now are sitting at 10th place in the East. They've got 26 games to go. Now, the gulf between 10 and 11 is so huge that it's possible they will weather this without Trey coming back and they'll still be in 10th. But I don't see them getting out of the play in if that happens and they don't have him. And if I'm him, I don't know if I just come back for like the, I mean, first of all, I don't know when doctors are going to say he can come back. And, you know, if they do come back for one game for two games and that then begs the question of, is this the last time have we seen the end of Trey Young in a Hawks uniform? Because there has been so much chatter around him and possible trade scenarios. Uh, Do you think he'll ever suit up for Atlanta again? I hope not. I hope this is the last time we see him in a Hawks uniform. Um, I've spoken on this plenty of times before. I feel like his talent is being wasted. His prime is being wasted. His talent is being wasted. Um, I feel like him handling this situation the way he is, I think it's a move based on, you know, a personal de- – it's a, it's a more personal decision. This is a more selfish decision, which I'm okay with. And the reason I say that, um, one, this team isn't going anywhere this year. Two, mm-hmm. they haven't really – shown that they're trying to improve or that they want to take the step to, you know, improve in this team or, or anything of that nature. So uh, I totally feel it's okay for Trey Young to make this type of move, get healthy, get yourself 100% correct, and, uh, you know, look forward to the next season, where the, whether that's in Atlanta or, you know, fingers crossed, my personal hope is the San Antonio Spurs. Spurs. I mean, uh, it's so perfect, right? It's it's, per- it's a match made in heaven. It just it just makes sense. Um, yep. But with that being said, uh, this this Hawks team just isn't doing anything for this talent. And uh, you know, I I take it personal because I was in that situation once, and uh, I would hate to see this talent just go continue to go to waste. Uh, I want him to be in a successful and winning environment so he can really show his talent and. Um, I think he deserves that. So uh, hopefully this offseason, this is a season where he puts his foot down, uses his power, and moves to a situation that's going to be uh, healthy for him. So, uh, you know, get healthy, get your injuries together, and, you know, be ready for your future. So uh, I don't see anything wrong with this move at all. Yeah. I mean, look, we don't know how serious it is. Sometimes something looks really minor, but there's ligament damage or whatever. So, you know, who knows what went into this medical decision, but I got to say, not only would he be such a perfect fit in San Antonio, the Spurs have a lot of the Hawks picks from the DeJounte Murray deal. So I'm sure Atlanta would like some of its picks back as well. So we have to look for that. But if Trey is available, there will be a lot of suitors lining up for Trey Young. And and I know all about the defense and everything, but he's improved. on. De- he's not a great defender, but he has improved on defense. He has steadily improved offensively and just looked more comfortable throughout the last couple seasons. And I think he would make a big difference to a lot of teams. Are the Lakers going to make a move for him this summer? They're going to have three number one draft picks starting after the, you know, starting at the draft. So that is going to be an interesting question. I, I just think there's going to be a lot of interest there. And from the Hawks perspective, in a way, this gives them a, you know, four to six week run to see what a DeJounte Murray led team mm-hmm. looks like, right? Because they've only been able to see him paired with Trey, except for a couple of random games this way. Okay, great. It's your team. He was obviously dangled out in trade for like a month leading up to the trade deadline, but now he's going to have the chance to be the leader on the floor. 
And I'm curious to see what happens and whether turns out that they're like, huh, we could trade Trey Young. We, we have something here with DeJounte. We're going to keep that part of the equation. So I, I do think it's an interesting turning point for the Hawks and Trey Young in their relationship. And we'll have to see what happens. But uh, I, I don't want to take anyone off a team because I know the fans of that team are always upset with media when we do that. But I just the idea of him and Wemby together is just so appealing. Absolutely insane. Like I said, that's a match made in heaven. And I, I pray to the basketball guys on a nightly. <laughs> Please send there we go. to San Antonio. <laughs> I need this to happen for basketball. Yeah, man. Right? <laughs> it would be so, so, so much fun. Um, I'm going to give you – you ever played the game Two Truths and a Lie book? Are you familiar mm-hmm. with that? Mm-hmm. I'm going to give you three stats. Two of them are true. One of them is a lie. You got to figure it out. Here it goes. Stat number one. Drew Holiday is shooting 64% on corner threes. Stat okay. two. Mike Conley has never had a technical foul in his entire career. Okay. Stat three, De'Aaron Fox is leading the league in steals. Ooh. Okay. And one of them is a lie? Mm-hmm. All right. I'm going to say the lie is Drew Holiday shooting 64 from corner threes. I know Mike Conley has never had a technical foul. Which is crazy, uh, by the way. Crazy. It really, it, it really is crazy. It, 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 as, as long and as great of a career as Mike has had, it almost makes you wonder, has he ever cared? We know, <laughs> <laughs> we know he cares. He's such no, a great know, leader. I know. We know Mike cares. But, man, it's like I said, it's just so many emotions in a basketball game. To never get one, it's tough. Imagine but, you know, if the two of you could, like, combine your technicals. That way you would have had half as many. <laughs> Nah, but we probably just end the year with 17. Zero for him, 17 for me. <laughs> but <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think De'Aaron Fox leading the league in steals is also a true statement. So I like it. What are the results? Let me know. Let me know. You are wrong, I Boogie am. Cousins. You are not correct. De'Aaron Fox is not leading the league in steals. Man, it's my other Kentucky <laughs> guard, right? Yep. Oh, man. Well, I was close. Shay. Shay. Yeah. Shout out to Shay. You're having an incredible year, bro. Incredible year. Yes. I mean, and shout out to Drew Holiday, 64% on corner threes. That's tough, Drew. It's really tough. That's not bad. That's not bad. I still think the Mike Conley stat is the most impressive. Definitely the most impressive. Crazy. There you go. All right. I'll take that bet presented by DraftKings. Let's look at the odds for LeBron reaching 40,000 points, which is just an insane sentence to say. 40,000 points. DraftKings has odds on when that is going to happen. LeBron right now, as we sit here, is 74 points from hitting that mark. Um, Boogie, let's take a look at the upcoming slate here and which games we think he might do this. Now, DraftKings is pegging the best odds for the March 4th game versus the Thunder. There's also a March 2nd game game before that, uh, where they have that at plus 150. That's against the Nuggets. Uh, there's a March 6th game versus the Kings. There's a game versus the Bucks, And then there's a game on Leap Day, February 29th, versus the Wizards, where the odds are plus, plus 2,000. But I don't know if the theory is he could get all 74 points in that game, because it is against the Wizards. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, Boog, which bet are you taking? Which game do you think LeBron will hit that number? Uh, I'm going to say it's going to take about, you know, three games to make this happen. So I'm going to go with March 2nd versus the Nuggets. Um, you know, I, let's say he just has two incredible games. Let's say he goes for, you know, 30 apiece. Like, we mm-hmm. we know he's You're about – You're still getting yeah, to that third game. Yeah, yeah. We know he's about 15 away. And, you know, LeBron scoring 15, I don't think that will ever be an issue. So uh, I'm going to go with March 2nd versus the Nuggets. I think just – Timing wise, mathematically wise, it just makes sense. I mean, I think part of it that you're playing with as a better is, you know, does he play on that back to back that the Lakers have coming up? So obviously that'll be a huge difference in all of these Very odds. Um, and again, don't underestimate the Wizards defense. I'm just saying. Um, and don't underestimate LeBron, by the way, in the fact that um, when he got close to passing Kareem, like, he just like put the foot on the gas. He wanted to do it. He wanted to do it quickly. 
Um, you know, I think he definitely enjoyed the distraction and he enjoyed what was happening, but he also wanted to get it over with a little bit and he wanted it to happen at home. So he sort of made that happen. Um, you know, LeBron is very wise about these things and obviously passing 40 K is not as sort of a tentpole moment in NBA history as passing Kareem specifically, but, he knows he, he 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 knows every point, every minute, everything, and um, I would expect him to try to get this done kind of quickly. And you know, as I said, the odds against the Wizards are plus two thousand, but you never know, people. You never know. So we'll see what happens. All right, we got to get to a quick doom scroll here uh, as we wrap up. Uh, Paolo Bancaro was uh, out Sunday with an illness. Now that was just one day removed from hitting the game winner. The Magic had a back-to-back with Detroit, right? So Saturday and Sunday in Atlanta, let's see. He was well enough to hit a game winner the day before. Boogie, I, I don't know. Do you think he got Magic city <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, you know, young fella is the ultimate professional. Uh, okay. He's always prepared for work. He's going to be a pro no matter if he's at work or outside of work. I think he carries himself the correct way. And uh, I'm just going to blame it on a bad batch of something. Okay. He, he okay. encountered a bad batch. and uh, But not a, a, not a bad up. batch of Magic City wings is what you're saying. I can't say that because they fry their wings hard. So I just don't really see <laughs> that being the case. <laughs> so uh, uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say this is a legit illness for the young fella. <laughs> all right. All right. I think that is probably true, by the way. But and if you're following along and don't know what we're talking about, just Google. You'll you'll see everything <laughs> you need to see. In fact, you'll see quite a lot, really. Oh so God. I'm Correct. just going to point you over there. <laughs> there you go. All right. But thank you so much, as always, for everyone out there. Thank you. You can catch all episodes of Bully Ball on the DraftKings Network, which is really cool. You can catch us on the All the Smoke Productions YouTube channel. And of course, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. So if you're listening right now in the car, and Boogie and I got to ride along with you. Thank you. We enjoyed the ride. And, you know, slow down in the passing lane. That's all I got to say. Uh, we'll catch you next week. Bye, guys. All right. <laughs>